in part one of our magnesium series, we looked at the front end of the story, why magnesium has to be bound to different counter ions, how those salts dissolve, why citrate and other organic forms often look better than oxide in acute studies, and why even a so-called poorly absorbed form like magnesium oxide can still improve sleep and hormones in the right context. Now we're going to zoom out. Instead of asking which form looks best in a single trial, we're going to ask a bigger question. When you look across all the human data on anxiety, stress, cognition, and brain aging, do any of these magnesium salts consistently outperform the others, or are they more similar than the marketing suggests? I'm William Wallace. You are listening to Daily Value. When you take a step back from individual trials and look at the broader human literature, the same pattern shows up as the one we saw in the individual magnesium trials we looked at in episode one. Benefits appear across many different magnesium salts, and no one form consistently outperforms any others. A 2017 systematic review by Boyle and colleagues published in the journal Nutrients looked at 18 human trials using a wide range of magnesium compounds, citrate, oxide, lactate, chloride, amino acid chelates, and found that several different forms produced improvements in anxiety-related or stress-related outcomes depending on the population. But because these studies varied in dose, duration, and sample characteristics, and because placebo effects were often large, the review ultimately concluded that the evidence was suggestive but insufficient to declare any specific form superior for neural or mood outcomes. In other words, across real human trials, multiple forms provided benefit, and no consistent hierarchy emerged. This is the turning point. Animal tissue distribution varies dramatically between forms, but in humans, clinical outcomes appear across multiple salts, even when bioavailability is low or modest. That broader pattern is consistent with newer and higher quality evidence. In 2024, a systematic review and meta-analyses published by Chen and colleagues in the journal Advances in Nutrition, pulled together data from 23 studies examining magnesium intake and cognitive outcomes in adults. These studies included both dietary magnesium and supplemental magnesium, and together they showed that higher total magnesium exposure was associated with better cognitive performance, particularly in domains like global cognition and working memory. But once again, the important detail is what was not found. Across all of these studies, there was no evidence that any specific magnesium salt provided a unique cognitive advantage. What mattered most was how much magnesium people were actually getting over time, not the form they used to get there. The data showed that 240 to 330 milligrams of magnesium over long periods of time was generally enough to see positive effects in cognitive domains and reduced disease risk. And when you line that up with the rest of the human literature, a very clear pattern emerges. Magnesium salts behave very differently in animals, where researchers can directly measure magnesium in the brain or muscle, but in humans, the clinical outcomes overlap much more than people assume. Magnesium L3 and 8 improves working memory and sleep architecture. Magnesium oxide can improve sleep efficiency and nighttime hormones in magnesium insufficient older adults. And across systematic reviews from anxiety and stress trials to this 2024 cognition analysis, you see the same signal. Multiple forms are beneficial, and no single magnesium salt consistently outperforms the others. Different forms dissolve and absorb at different rates, but once magnesium is actually in the body, meaningful benefits appear across a wide range of salts, including those traditionally labeled as poorly absorbed. When you zoom out from individual trials and look at long-term evidence, one issue becomes obvious. People often mix up two completely different arguments how magnesium salts differ from each other, and how the other molecule attached to magnesium may have its own effects. Keeping these separate is important to understand what really matters. The first argument is about magnesium itself. Different salts dissolve differently. Citrate dissolves well in acidic environments. Glycinate is gentle on the gut. Oxide dissolves poorly unless pH is extremely low. Taurates and acetylterates show acute increase in brain concentrations in rodents. These are all legitimate differences in how magnesium gets absorbed or distributed, especially in short-term studies or models where tissue can be measured directly. But then there's the second argument, claims that a magnesium salt is superior because the ligand, glycine, taurine, malate, or threonate, 
has its own physiological effects, and here the truth is more nuanced. Magnesium glycinate is often described as calming magnesium. In reality, a dose of 400 milligrams of elemental magnesium from glycinate, it delivers roughly two and a half grams of glycine, a dose high enough to have independent calming and sleep supporting effects. But that isn't a special property of magnesium. It's simply close to a meaningful glycine intake delivered alongside of it. And many countries do not permit recommending magnesium at doses high enough to reliably deliver that glycine benefit. Magnesium taurate is similar. A typical supplemental amount brings along hundreds of milligrams of taurine, which has supported effects on cardiovascular and stress physiology. Again, any unique effect may come from the taurine, not the magnesium component necessarily. Magnesium malate is the opposite. It's marked as energy magnesium because malic acid participates in the Krebs cycle, but that claim collapses under basic biochemistry. Supplemental malate does not increase ATP production, and no human trials show unique energy effects. Malate is simply a well-tolerated ligand, not an energy booster. When you separate these two arguments, the magnesium component and the ligand, the long-term data become much more clear. What actually predicts benefits is consistent total magnesium intake, not the salt. In the 2024 cognitive meta-analyses by Chen that we referenced, cognitive benefits appeared when people reached 240 to 330 milligrams of total magnesium per day, regardless of the form. No magnesium salt provided a unique cognitive advantage. Baseline status also matters. People who start out low respond the most. That's exactly why magnesium oxide improves sleep physiology in magnesium insufficient older adults, despite its modest solubility. And when you look at long-term brain aging data, the pattern holds. Higher habitual magnesium intake is linked with better hippocampal volume and fewer white matter lesions, again, with no form difference. So in the end, the salt affects how magnesium dissolves and is absorbed, and the ligand may sometimes have its own effects, but the long-term benefits come from overall magnesium intake, consistency, and baseline need, not from choosing a super magnesium. And with all that in mind, here's how to actually apply this in real life. First, choose a form you can afford and tolerate and can take consistently. Citrate, glycinate, malate, chloride, and taurate all dissolve well and absorb reliably. If one upsets your stomach, switch. Tolerability matters more than the salt chemistry. Second, if your baseline magnesium is low, you don't need a boutique form to get results. In older adults who are magnesium insufficient, even magnesium oxide at 500 milligrams a day split between two doses improves sleep efficiency, melatonin levels, cortisol, and overall insomnia scores, despite its modest solubility. When you actually need magnesium, a basic form still works. Third, Avoid low solubility salts at low doses. Oxide and carbonate can be effective, but only when the dose is high enough. At small doses, most of the magnesium simply won't dissolve. If you want the convenience of one or two capsules a day, choose a more soluble form. Fourth, remember that the dose matters more than the salt. In the 2024 cognition meta-analyses, benefits generally appeared once people reached 240 to 330 milligrams of total magnesium per day, whether from food or supplements or both. And this aligns with long-term brain aging data showing that higher habitual intake is associated with larger hippocampal and gray matter volume in midlife adults. Fifth, if you want the effects of the ligand, take the ligand directly. Magnesium glycinate usually doesn't deliver three grams of glycine used in sleep studies. Magnesium taurate won't deliver the gram level taurine doses used for cardiovascular support. And magnesium malate will not meaningfully change ATP production. If you want something like glycine or taurine benefits, take them separately at their clinically effective doses. And finally, don't overthink the form. The biggest predictors of benefit are your baseline magnesium status, your total intake, and your consistency over 8 to 12 weeks or longer. Now, it's quite possible that forms like 3 and 8 or acetyl taurate have acute effects that some salts do not provide acutely until there are human trials comparing these things head to head the best we have are meta-analyses and reviews doing as much. As far as we can tell, the differences between salts matter for solubility and GI comfort, but the long-term outcomes probably converge. So that's the real story behind magnesium forms. The chemistry matters, the ligands matter a little, but the long-term benefits come from getting enough magnesium consistently in a form your body tolerates. That is truly what matters the most. If you found this helpful, share it with somebody who's confused about which magnesium to buy. And if there's another nutrient you want broken down the same way, please send it my way.
Thank you all for listening to Daily Value. Until next time, stay healthy.